Welcome everybody. I'm uh, Chris Williams from the Royal Forestry Society and welcome to Book Club. And tonight we welcome Professor Joe Bradwell. Um, Joe spent his career as a physician, then moved into uh, clinical research. And in 2008, Joe and his family embarked on upon, upon a new venture, with Norbury Park, which of course we're going to hear about uh, shortly. Amongst other awards, Joe's received the Peter Savile Award and the RFS's Silver Trophy for his contribution to forestry. As well as being home to an innovative silvicultural practice, Norbury Park is also home to the Bifor Face Facility, which is looking at the effects of enhanced levels of CO2 on our trees. Joe, welcome to Book Club. Hi, good evening to everybody. Okay, so before we get into um, uh, hearing more from, from Joe, um, I should just introduce um, Wendy, who's our communications officer joining us today, is going to be helping us. Behind the scenes, we also have Andrea. So um, we've got a team of people um, to help uh, help us along tonight. Um, so obviously we're going to be hearing more about Joe's, Joe's book. Um, there'll be an opportunity uh, for people to, to ask questions. And um, so welcome everybody again. And uh, I'm now going to hand over to, to Wendy. Right, hello everybody. Um, lovely to have so many of you joining tonight. I'm Wendy Neckar. I'm the communications officer for the Royal Forestry Society. And like so many of you, I've had the privilege of going around both Norbury Park and its woodlands and the FACE facility. And I'd really defy anyone not to be impressed by both. So this is this book really at the heart of this book is, is Joe over there and his wife, Barbara. Um, it's a couple who, who had a deep concern about climate change and about their, their own carbon footprint. And um, they, they, they set off on a quest for knowledge. And I think Joe will acknowledge they, they had the ability to, to perhaps research a little bit more than, than, than most of us and put that knowledge to the test and then to share that knowledge with academia and with the forestry world. And we are all benefiting hugely from that. So, so thank you, Joe. Um, it's, a, it's a book that, that charts their journey and it's a journey that you won't be surprised it is guided by science. But at the same time, I found it was an incredibly readable and accessible book. So you have the science and you have the charts and you have the graphs and you have the facts and the figures. But you also have the people behind that and, and what it means and why, why they are looking into all this. Um, and, and a lot of what Joe talks about is so, so topical to, to everything that we hear today. Um, that could be about the, the tree mixes, it's about the rise in carbon levels, it's about temperature, it's about climate change, it's about pests and diseases. So almost everything that he touches upon is, is something which we, we've all been asking ourselves about for some time. Uh, so just before we go to you for questions, um, I think we're going to ask Joe for a couple of, uh, to, to, to talk to us, and he has a couple of slides. And I think the first one, I don't know if Andrea, you can, can put that up. And Joe, perhaps you can tell us about, this starts at the beginning, doesn't it? So this is this is the first slide. It's the um, it's the front page of the edition two of the book. And Joe, perhaps you could talk us through that. Yes, pleasure. Well, good evening to everybody again. The, uh, the project was um, based on my carbon guilt, my, uh, myself and my wife. Uh, we traveled the world, We'd, I've flown to medical meetings and holidays. So, um, and the average UK carbon emissions per capita is about 13 tonnes per year. So uh, we probably were emitting perhaps 25 or even 50 tonnes per year and all adding to the climate problems, CO2 buildup. So we decided we'd um, buy a woodland to store carbon and uh, based on the, the assumption that a, a, a hectare of woodland might store eight or 10 tons per hectare per year. And uh, we thought, well, we can, having sold a, a, a university spin-out company from Birmingham, we thought we could do rather better than that. So we bought a couple of hundred hectares of, uh, of woodland uh, to store perhaps a couple of thousand tons per year. Uh, but then someone pointed out that we couldn't really claim that because we hadn't planted the woodland. So we planted another 150 hectares on arable land, 
to make a, a, re a true claim and uh, adding up to uh, perhaps 3,000 tonnes per year. And then we added some uh, complex herbal lays, which you can see on the front uh, cover of the book here on the uh, lower left. Uh, herbal lays are complex grass type mixtures uh, for grazing land and they store lots of carbon. Uh, we didn't, when we stopped um, plowing the land, which, which kills the worms and emits more carbon. And having, having done that, we, um, we thought, well, the experiment's all very well, but I'm retired, no longer a professional, uh, retired from medical research, but the Birmingham my un the University, which was where I worked for 40 years, uh, would be interested. So uh, with, with some surplus money from this sale, we uh, offered them a facility on the, on the uh, Norby Park, and they've built the FACE facility, that's a free air carbon dioxide uh, enrichment facility, to test the robustness of a uh, oak plantation, oak woodlands, about 160 years old, to see how they fared in future high CO2 levels to the year 2050. And the recent information shows that, in fact, the trees are growing better in the, the rings that are enriched with carbon dioxide compared with control rings that are only having air sprayed into them. They're growing about 10% faster, which is good news for the climate because there's a, it, the, the forests across the world will absorb more carbon in a, in a, in a uh, enriched environment. But we also noticed um, that the trees that we'd planted in these mixtures were growing particularly well. And you can see in the center there, there's a large tree. Uh, and on the uh, left-hand side, there's a tree from the estate, which is 33 year old, but our mixtures, our complex mixtures of 30 species were growing much quicker. And you can see they're growing two to three times quicker than we'd expected. And uh, because the, it's been realized over the last seven or eight years or so from multiple publications in the, the science literature that these mixtures grow quicker than monocultures. And that's really been the basis of the book. I wanted to, to transmit this information uh, on a wide basis to people in the UK. So the Forestry Commission and, and private uh, uh, forestry um, uh, builders uh, should plant mixtures rather than monocultures if we want to absorb more CO2. So that's our journey so far, uh, early days, but uh, we do believe that these mixtures will carry on growing at, at high rates of carbon sequestration. That's thank lovely, you. Joe. Thank, thank you for that, Joe. Um, I know we have a second slide coming up. Just a reminder to people, if you have a question for Joe, please put it in the Q&A function and you can do that at any point this evening. Um, so I think if we move to our second slide, this is what I'm, I've been calling Joe's manifesto. It was on page 117 of the first edition and is now, I think, on pages 52 or 53 of the second edition um, and I wonder Joe could you just take us through those your your seven points yes indeed thank you uh, thank you uh, so um, every a monoculture will grow at a certain rate uh, obviously we see monocultures of larch and, and spruce across the country uh, but each tree is sitting next to an identical tree and competes with it it competes for sunlight it competes for nutrients from the soil uh, and of course the monocultures are more prone to diseases uh, whereas if it's in a mixture then those uh, disadvantages disappear and 20 or 30 species uh, is a is a good size mixture not one or two every additional species adds a little more carbon sequestration into the woodland and uh, the second point is that um, if you have species from other countries they, uh, they add to the mixture, of course, they add to the robustness, uh, they're um, more phylogenetically and, uh, and structurally different they are from our own trees, the more they are likely to survive uh, differences in climate change and pests and diseases. We always mix conifers with deciduous trees, it adds to the, uh, the beauty of the woodland. Conifers grow quickly, uh, deciduous trees uh, need to be protected from those fast growth rates a little. Uh, by uh, so we we have to thin out the conifers a little. Uh, we include nitrogen fixing trees. About twenty percent of the trees 
should include uh, 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 trees such as alders and uh, laburnums and oleasters. Post-glacial soils are nitrogen deficient. So if we add nitrogen to any woodland, they, the trees always grow quicker. So why not add nitrogen fixing trees? It's cheaper, it's free, uh, and it's simple. And we found in the face experiment that the, the trees that are growing quicker are running out of nitrogen. So it's likely to uh, reduce their increased uh, ability to fix carbon uh, in the future. Halo pollarding, point five. Um, to maintain the mixtures, we don't want to kill any other trees. But if we've got a winning tree, uh, the trees around it will be competing with it, perhaps overshadowing it, reducing light access to the canopy of our winner. So if we pollard the neighboring trees that are overshadowing it uh, above the lowest growth ring, then the, those trees will survive. Uh, they will uh, maintain their root structure, their carbon sequestration, but they'll allow the winner to be above the canopy and, gr and grow faster in the higher light environment. I'm not, I'm a, a, a relatively decisive person, but we don't know what the winners will be in the future. So uh, if we defer decisions on the final winners uh, to determine their growth rates, which trees we like, uh, how they fit into the environment and how they respond to climate change, um, that is an advantage. Uh, and uh, we might want to keep oak trees, even though they grow slower than the conifers uh, by halo pollarding around them and, and keeping their canopy open. Of course, we must, we must control pests and diseases. Uh, the pests, gray squirrels are a pest. Uh, of course, everywhere uh, we've, we trap and uh, bolt trap the squirrels. We kill about seven or 800 per year with 100 different 100, uh, traps. It's expensive. We've, uh, we've designed a new tree that uh, new with trap that doesn't need uh, a daily uh, inspection only a weekly inspection, and that re reduces the cost by 80 to 90% since the vast majority of the costs are staff costs, checking the traps every day, which has to be done by law. A deer, we uh, have fortunately very few deer. Uh, the, the woods are active with people um, uh, uh, changing the, uh, the, the, the um, herbal lays and there are people going into the woodlands to thin them, etc. So we have very few deer, but those we do have, uh, we, cu we curl uh, by shooting and that's 10 to 15 per year. So right. that's a brief summary, thank you. That's a fab fabulous list, and I'm quite sure there must be people out there with some questions on it. So I'm going to, to open up to questions now, and um, we'll turn to Chris for the first question. So Chris, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Joe, for taking us through um, uh, yeah, your, your seven sort of principles of, uh, of what you're trying to achieve and what you think others should should seek to achieve in their in their woodlands um and my first, my questions about the en enhanced growth rates from um mixed uh, species woodlands and uh, i remember at, at norbury park because we had the whole society meeting there a couple of years ago and you 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 had the uh, the two cross sections and you handed them out and everyone went, oh, wow i think that's it's amazing um the, the same size but you know one was um uh, many years um uh, older than than the other and um and you could see that the stand that we were in everyone was was really impressed with the the growth rates that we witnessed in the stand we were in so, well, my question is really about why do you think um, more people haven't adopted um, this approach? I mean, there are other, other examples, but it's not widespread. Any thoughts about that in terms of some of the challenges that you faced and why maybe more people haven't adopted um, the, the mixtures that you've got at Norbury? I think uh, it's true for all um, changes in whatever we do. It takes time for people to adopt them. Uh, even revolutionary changes uh, are, are open to suspicion. People fear that it's not going to be as, as good as the as the is advertised uh, by the proponent to begin with. Uh, so I expect it to take time. But foresters are trained traditionally; they tra with traditional techniques. It takes a while. And um, in the science community, scientific community, one would rather cynically say that progress advances one funeral at a time. And uh, and uh, so um, with all with that, with that background, I think inevitably it takes time. 
it's a long commitment. It's a, it's a, a tree is a lifetime of growth. Uh, I can I can imagine that people are, are wary of committing a lot of money to changes they're not certain of. Okay, but well, so you think it might just be a matter of time before we we see more adoption of um, some of the practices that you you demonstrated. The um the the benefits are carbon storage, of course, which uh, we're all concerned about. Um, there's uh, reduction in pests and diseases is uh, helpful uh, in the Amazon rainforest, which is, of course is prey and uh, preyed on about by, by everything, uh, pest diseases, bacteria, virus, everything. There's two or three hundred species per hectare, and uh, and that it's the oldest forest in the world. It's been there hundred million years. Uh, the UK forests are only since the last ice ages. So uh, in time, the for a natural forest will adopt a strategy of having innumerable species uh, to protect itself. And so in the Amazon, you never get one species next to an identical tree. It's diluted out by other species. So pest disease is important. Uh, carbon sequestration buildup is always important. And, and also we want to grow timber trees. So uh, it's expensive growing timber trees. Uh, the discounted cash flow is, is, is always adverse. Um, so if you can go grow trees twice as quickly, then clearly the, the, um, the benef cost benefits uh, are potentially very high. So those three reasons are, are very good reasons to plant mixtures. Okay, thank you. Should we go to our first, um, our first question um, submitted then? So is that uh, Stuart Morwood? Yes, uh, I, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, jo Joe, um, many thanks for uh, that uh, e excellent pre presentation. Um, I, I'm, uh, uh, I live in uh, Northern Ireland um, and I, I'm afraid my geography uh, of uh, where precisely Norbury Park is is, 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 is is limited. And perhaps you could tell me a little about the, um, the, the soil types, the elevation, uh, the local climate uh, to give me uh, an, an idea of the uh, in, environment. And also um, I was uh, intrigued by your um, quite wide um, uh, selection of different species. I recollect 20 to 30 you mentioned. Um, ha have you um, marketed uh, any of your timber as, as yet is the second question. Well, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, they're only 14 years old. Uh, they only had 14 summers since we first planted them. We planted uh, at about 70 acres per year for five years uh, to, to build up uh, um, about three or four hundred, perhaps half a million trees. So uh, they're, a bit, they're too young, uh, except for the, for the pollarding. Uh, we've put the uh, pollard stems uh, into fire logs and to wood chip. So that's, that's sold or used, um, used on the estate. Um, the location of the uh, woodland is in the middle of England, north northwest Midlands, I suppose we might say, near Stoke on Trent, uh, and and west of uh, Stafford. Its uh, elevation is about uh, a couple of hundred feet from bottom to top, so from 190 feet up to about 350 feet. It's um, it gets cold, can get cold in the winter. We we have minus 10 to 15 uh, for brief periods, perhaps once every three or four years, uh, coming off the uh, North Cheshire Plain. Uh, we get uh, the soil types, mixed soil. We're right at the end of the last ice sheet. So the, uh, it stops in the, in the middle of the country for probably a thousand or so, so years. So there's deposits of boulder clay, uh, boulders. Uh, and then on top of that, of that is, um, is more recent loamy soil, uh, thin layers. But it varies from patches by patches can be completely different. On the top of the, the, the hillocks that we have, there's often very sandy soil. So complete mix, probably 40 different soil types. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, can we move now to Gary Primrose? Gary, lovely to see you here tonight. Um, and it doesn't surprise me, but Gary, you have a question about squirrels. Um, I thought we'd get a few. Yes, hello. Um, yeah. Hi, Gary. Hello, 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 and very much enjoyed your, your book. And um, well, I have a million questions, but I'll just focus on the, the one around squirrels, really. What, um, 
are are the traps that you're using the bolt traps that you don't have to visit very often are they commercially available uh, yes well that's an important question it's um we've uh, well, they're not commercially available till april we had a, a, a very nice grant from um, innovation uh, uk uh, defra to to finally trial these traps we've been working on them for about four years they're based on the kenya trap and the Kenya trap, uh, as you as you know, has to be visited every day. Uh, there, there's two or three problems with it. Um, that's one of them. Uh, so uh, we incorporated a um, trap door uh, by, by the bolt. So as the squirrel goes into the trap and the, get, tries to get to the back past the bolt to the food, um, the bolt hits the squirrel on the neck, just like the Kenya trap, and that triggers a trap door which drops the squirrel, dead squirrel onto the ground where it's uh, removed as carrion. The, trap, the traps are set about three feet above the ground. So, uh, so uh, foxes and, um, and badgers will remove it or maybe birds. Maybe we have quite a few buzzards. So that solves that problem of, of not having to check it every day. But the other issue is the um, it, important issue is it has to be baited every day at the front and squirrels and birds and uh, and mice remove all the tr all the food from the front of the trap every day so it has to be visited just to, to uh, add the add the bait so we've add we've put in a hopper of 2 liters of 2 uh, liters of food behind the bolt and we've tilted the trap to about 20 degrees and small mice and uh, small birds go into the tunnel over the over the trap door and the bolt past the treadle or through the treadle because then they're too light to trigger the bot the, um, the the treadle and the bolt and they peck at the bird feeder behind the bot beyond the bolt and that releases more food which because of the angle of the trap tilting forward the food comes over the bolt over the trap door and trickles out to the front baiting the trap every day as these small animals uh, go go on to it and the hopper holds food for one to two weeks so continuously baiting it the traps typically fire off about once a month we have a hundred traps out uh, over a five to six month period and uh, we catch five or six hundred squirrels so it isn't it only fires off irregularly but this keeps it baited until it's uh, until it fires mm. the um it's uh, it's a trap we've made um a couple of hundred of these traps uh, we're doing final tests under this DEFRA grant in February and March. And uh, we, the initial trials last year, we caught 1,200 squirrels last year. But the final trials will just tinker with some of the details of the trap to make it slightly more efficient. And then we'll release it as soon as we've got that data and the grant is finished in April. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I know when you talked about this, uh, um, on on site where you 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 mentioned you said there's a zero tolerance of of squirrels you take this very seriously it's obviously quite a bit of investment uh in 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 this research and um and also people well to date people employed to um you know to to, to support that so it'd be great if you can make that that step change so that you don't require the the same level of um commitment in terms of time but um, let's good luck. Good luck with that. I'm sure there'll be everyone on this call. will be very interested to uh, to to see how that works out, and and will be possibly wanting to uh, to get hold of the traps themselves. So let's move on to a different area now. And um, uh, James Souter has a question about um, about pollarding. We'll ask the question on his behalf. And um, so says Joe: Are there any trees that don't respond well to pollarding? The deciduous trees can be. Uh, um, coppice or pollarded um, easily. Uh, very, uh, so they're they're all okay with uh, with pollarding. We all, we we always do it bef above the lowest uh, ring of branches that are alive, so the trees don't get killed. Conifer trees don't pollard quite so well, uh, except perhaps for coast redwood, which uh, will rapidly regrow from uh, from the, its base. Uh, so again, we, we pollard above the lowest ring of, uh, of branches. Uh, this should be done within a few years of, of, their, of their planting. The uh, 
we'd normally do it when the canopy closes at year seven or six, uh, when their when their their height is quite low still. And uh, in our experience, ninety five percent of the trees will survive the pollarding. Um, should we go um, go now to um, uh, Bruce Octoloni? Hi, Joe. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Loud that's and clear. Start. That's good. That's a good start then. Um, Joe, thanks uh, very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, I yeah, good on, evening. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I, I picked up on that you mentioned that you experienced a 10% faster growth rate in CO2 enriched rings. I wonder if you could kind of expand on that, what you meant by rings and what tent that involves. Yes, the, um, the, the, the face, face experiments are pumping carbon dioxide, free air carbon dioxide enrichment into the trees, into, uh, into trees uh, in the open woodlands and, and uh, monocultures and, and in our case to a, a complex adult oak uh, woodland. Uh, the CO2 has to be put into all areas of the trees so that the rings are about 30 metres across. They've got seven or eight mature trees in them, plus the in understory of, of witch elm or or uh, or um, larch, sorry, not larch, uh, hazel, and uh, there was some ash in there. And plus, of course, the the, uh, the 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 trees and shrubs that are on the on the ground. Uh, the kind of the canopy is about twenty five to thirty meters high. The ring, the rings, uh, comprise about twenty different towers. They rise up to the above the canopy, and on each tower are a couple of carbon dioxide uh, plastic tubes which go from the, from the base up to the top with holes in them. And the CO2 is pumped through those holes into the center of the ring. Uh, the center of the rings contain sensors at, at ground level, mid level and high level. And they're sampling the CO2 in the rings uh, every second uh, of, during the incubation periods during the day and in the summer. And this, the sensing uh, is fed back to a computer which regulates the amount of CO2 that's fired into the middle of the rings. So if it's windy, uh, the, there's no point in, in, in pumping carbon dioxide downwind. So the downwind rings, the downwind, sorry, downwind wind, uh, tubes on these um, on the rings will be turned off, and the, the rings are incubated from the CO2 on the upwind side. So that's how they work. Uh, it's complex procedure. Uh, the ring system, uh, which is six of them, three enriched with carbon dioxide, three with uh, control rings just with air, cost about 15 million pounds to put up. It's a copy of a similar facility uh, near Sydney in Australia. And it's, that's based on earlier rings uh, based uh, in, the, in the US, but not in open natural woodlands. There's only two facilities in the world. That's the uh, Uke Face facility near Sydney in a eucalyptus woodland, and this one in at Norbury in the center of England. That's interesting. Thank you very much. I mean, fifteen million pounds. Obviously, it's not something to be replicated elsewhere, practically well, in the UK. Well, the um, there's there's a move to, to put one in the uh, in the Amazon rainforest. That inspired our our interest uh, twelve years ago, 10, 12 years ago. They were just starting, uh, but they couldn't get uh, money. Uh, but Birmingham University and myself decided that we we try one in, in the uh, temperate woodlands, which comprise about 30% of global woodlands. So, so far more important than the eucalyptus woods, which are about 2% in Sydney. And, uh, and in the meantime, this, over these 10 years, the UK and German governments have put money into the uh, Amazon face facility. The trees are bigger, they're more complex, the CO2 is more expensive, much more expensive facility. And there are plans to put one in the great boreal forests, perhaps up in Sweden, so that will cover sort of 90% of the world's forest to give a very uh, a much better view of the future impact of uh, rising CO2 levels on our, our absorbing uh, global woodlands. Hmm. Could, um, Joe, thank you for that. Is, um, do you say a little bit more about the future of that facility? Because I, I think, is it, am I right in thinking it's got another couple of years with the CO2 enhancement, but then is there... Is it going to continue beyond the, the sort of current, that, that period? Yes, well, the, the plan originally was to 10 years of enrichment. And we've, um, we've, we've extended that now by a further donation. So it'll be at least 15 years. So it's, it's been enriched for seven years. So we've got another eight years to go. 
the CO2 is very expensive. It was it originally cost about 60 pounds a ton, and there would be 20 tons per day squirted into the environment during only during the day, uh, and only when the leaves were were out. Um, but it costs um, a million pounds a year. Uh, it, the, the the cost of the CO2 went up seven or eight fold in the U start of the Ukraine crisis. Mm -hmm. It was 600 pounds a ton. Uh, it's now dropped back to about 150 pounds a ton. And fortunately, they've got a very good long-term source from a from a uh, bi a bio source, uh, which is um, going to guarantee the price for the next few years. Mm, yeah. Okay. And uh, there's. For those who want to know more, obviously it's it's mentioned in in the book, but it does also we go on to the sort of buy for website. There's there's, there's good source um, of information about the facility there. So uh, let, let's move on to a, a different subject now, and um, to go to Tim. <coughs> evening, Tim. Uh, uh, Tim Kurt's got a question for you, Joe. Hi, Tim. Good evening. Hello, Joe. Uh, I've seen and greatly admired your woods and what you have achieved at Norbury. Terrific. Very kind. Thank you. But apart from chip and firewood, is timber production a part of the grand plan? Yes, indeed. We have a wood mill uh, we, we on, the, on site. When, um, we, when I bought the estate 15 years ago, uh, there were a lot of tree, a lot of timber trees on the estate. Uh, it had been a shooting uh, estate uh, by, run by Lord, owned by Lord Litchfield. And the... Uh, the uh, woodsmen were excluded from the wood most of the time by the people who were looking after the pheasants. Uh, so the trees had been relatively ignored. Uh, there were three or 4,000 large trees, many in the, un many, uh, in the understory at that age, uh, despite being 170 or 80 years old. So we thinned those out. That fed the mill for, for several years, but the mill uh, has been so successful that we ran out of timber. Now we have to buy timber from other parts of the UK, mostly oak, but some larch and uh, Douglas fir. Uh, and our woodlands, our young woodlands, are still too young to go into the mill. The largest diameter trees we have are the, the hybrid larch, and they're only about 15 inches across. Uh, they need to be 20 inches before we can harvest them. So that's another five years away yet. Very much for that. Thank you. Pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you for your questions. Keep keep putting them in. The next question we have, actually, Joe, is from an anonymous attendee. So I'm going to read that out um, and then we'll move to another one on a similar subject from William Lee. So the anonymous attendee is saying, in addition to planting a mixture of species, did you also diversify by provenance? And if so, what approach did you use to select those provenances? Are there any differences observed in growth or health by provenance? Uh, yes, the, um, we've got over 140 different species across the estate. Uh, we, the initial plantings, which were 14 years ago, were native broadleaves pretty well, plus a few uh, alien conifers, such as uh, uh, larch and Douglas fir and, uh, and Norway spruce. Uh, but since then, we've widened the selection uh, but at the heart of the initial plantings was was a, a future oak forest, uh, and that was a UK provenance and some French provenance. Uh, but since then, we've put in Dutch uh, oak trees and uh, more French oak trees, which have uh, been selected to be especially uh, good form. And of course, they come from more southerly climes, so they might do better in a in a in a warming climate. Uh, we're, we're planning to. Uh, we've we've got a a, um, sea, a tree seed orchard. We're, we've started. We plan to bring in a hundred different trees from across the world, temperate forests across the world. Uh, and this in this seed orchard, we're planting a, um, these hundred species over a five-year period, and we hope to generate seeds from them, which will be uh, used for uh, providing seeds into the UK. There's a difficulty getting different seeds from across the UK. Forest start is very good, but they're importing them as well. If we had our own tree seed orchard with covering a lot of these uh, foreign trees, which are which are very good provenances. Uh, America, for instance, has over 25 different oak species. Wouldn't it be great to have them in the UK? If the, if the uh, tree seed orchard survives well, 
in in Norbury, then the seeds will do well in uh, around uh, around the UK. So that's our long term plan, uh, early stages, but most interesting. Fabulous, mm. thank you. I hope that answers that question. Just before, just before we move on, so um, the, it's interesting about the the tree, um, uh, the seed seed orchards that you're uh, developing. So are they mostly from North America? Or where you said all around the world, but are they certain latitudes that you're looking at? Uh, the, well, the, um, that's a very difficult question to answer in, in some ways. If if we were, I was in the, the states with uh, Gerind, uh Richards recently. We spent a couple of weeks looking at different uh, provinces, different uh, seed suppliers, and so, for instance, um, in Arbogen, which is in South Carolina, they they produce. 300 million loblolly pines every year. Loblolly grows well in the UK, despite the provinces in in South uh, Southeast America going down from Flor uh, Florida all the way up to Illinois and towards Chicago. They will they will easily survive in the UK and have a massive range of, uh, of provinces in the, in the states. Uh, so we plan to bring a variety of provinces of loblolly pine in into the UK. Uh, they grow in grow in Staffordshire near us in Cannock Chase. So that's one example of a province. Mm -hmm. We're also in a northwest state in the Pacific Northwest. And we're going to import several different provinces of uh, Douglas fir, a favourite tree, great future tree for the UK, uh, not attacked too too much at the moment by pests uh, and diseases. So uh, so yes, we we're looking at a wide range. But of course, there are southern continent species. Uh, that would be useful. Some Northophagus. It'd be nice to bring some different cryptomeria from Japan and uh, China, China trees, of course. Chinese trees are good. Uh, the, the, um, there's some Fractionus uh, uh, Manchuria. I haven't quite said that quite right. Manchuriensis uh, is resistant to emerald ash borer. So that's an important future risk. So we're going to bring some of those in. Well, we've, we've got some already in, in, the, in the tree seed orchard. Okay, well, it'll be really interesting to see how you get on. And I know DEFRA there's a bit of a push uh, to try and get more um, tree seed orchards um, sort of registered. So there's a the grants are available, I think, aren't there, to, uh, yes. to support. Yes. So let's let's move on now. So Wendy. Um, yeah, I think we're moving to William Lee next, if, if William's there. So William's question, it must be, have been so satisfying to have seen the mixes get away so quickly. Has the halo pollarding, pollarding visual oddity received any comment from passers-by? Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. Thank you, William. That's a, that's a good, that's a fun question. <laughs> the um, the tree growth rates increase with the mixtures, uh, but the winners uh, benefit probably as much again, or maybe even more, from halo pollarding. A tree growth rate is dependent on the amount of canopy exposed to sunlight. Uh, by halo pollarding, the oak trees are fully exposed to sunlight. Any competition, any shadowing from neighbouring trees is removed. We, typically, we'd pollard to make sure that there's a couple of metres of canopy free spe free air around the, the winners. Uh, over a, a couple, two or three years, that'll uh, in, the neighbouring trees will encroach on that, in which case we, uh, we halo pollard again. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, a, that's, uh, that's very good. Um, the, in, the, the pollarding um, looks odd for only a few months of the year. The trees are spreading by one or two feet on their side branches every year. So it rapidly, rapidly closes off and the, and the woodland is, um, is, is, looks normal at the end of the season. We haven't had any complaints. <laughs> uh, so um, we only have complaints when, we, when, we, when we've cleared a few uh, areas of the woodland which have been very poor uh, poor, poor specimens uh, from uh, historic squirrel damage. And then we, then we have to, we've had to clear some clear fell some oak which are forty years old because they're ir ir irredeemable. So then people complain a bit if they're on the on the bridleways. Uh, but then of course we replant we replant immediately. So now the um, the neighbours and the visitors along the bridleways are all delighted to see such lovely trees which aren't squirrel damaged lovely thank you okay. and then um, let's um let's now go uh a different tack here which so is an interesting question from val hamilton hopefully val is there hi val hi good evening 
Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Perfect. Oh, great. Um, we live in Highland, Scotland, um, and you various things have made me smile that you said, but one of them was you said everyone is focused on carbon capture. No, they're not. Up here, um, emphasis is on native pine wood, saving the capercaillie, um, lack of change. Um, this, how do we get recognition of the need for resilience and diversity um, from bodies such as Nature Scotland, the Cairngorms National Park Authority, the RSPB? I'm not talking about um, destroying the, the ancient Caledonian pine wood, but much of the pine wood up here is plantation anyway. But um, the idea of putting anything in other than Scots pine is, well, it's more than frowned upon. Yes, yes. Well, I can understand that. Uh, the Caledonian forest is, is, is unique for Scots pine. Uh, what, uh, everyone has views on what should be in their neighbourhood, and I think it's quite reasonable to keep it as a, as a, a broad monoculture. Uh, but other parts of Scotland, um, people have view. People live in the cities, they have views on street trees. Uh, people who, uh, who love birds have views on what, the, what should be planted in, in, the, in woodlands. Uh, and, the, and of course, everyone has views on climate and climate change in their own little area. But the overriding problem in the world for the future of the planet is CO2 buildup. And um, so if we take a, a, the biggest view of the problem, COP28, COP26, of course, in Scotland, uh, the, 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 we must have climate carbon dioxide mitigation and sequestration. So I put that as number one on my priority list. Uh, nice woodlands which are resistant to infections and, and pests. I put that as number two. Uh, and timber, we import 85% of our timber, 90% of our timber. Yep. Uh, we have a timber mill. I, I, want to, I want trees for my timber mill to sell. Thank you. Yeah, that, thank, thank you, Val. It's a really interesting uh, area, isn't it? But the, the, the balance between different objectives in terms of, you know, people talk about the environment generally, but of course there's different threads to that. And, I'd like to think that you know, hopefully, the um, you know, your your words and many others will be like truly multi-purpose. So, that, as well as the carbon question, they will also support um, plenty of plenty of wildlife interests as well. Uh, but I know you, you once you get into um, certain subjects in Scotland, you mentioned about the Cape of Cayley, and it becomes a it's 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 a more nuanced in terms of the species mix that you might want to to be able to support different species. So it gets more interesting. Um, I can see, um, I believe, um, joined by es es one of my predecessors, Esmond, Esmond Harris, um, so is, is with us. And we don't know what the question is, but I believe you've got your hand up. So could we go, to, could we go to Esmond now, please? Yes, Professor Bradwell, I wonder whether you're aware of the long-term experiments at Fascally and Ventress in Scotland. These were started by Professor Anderson back in the 50s, um, not as detailed as, as yours, but by now there is a very long record of uh, managing mixed forest. He was of the view that a mixed forest produced a higher volume, but I'm afraid he didn't live long enough himself to prove it. The records are still in existence. I was at Fascally a few years ago. Uh, I'm not absolutely up to date. But it looks as if you are aware because you've just uh, responded to my to my remarks. Are you aware of what's being done there, and is there any relevance to what you're doing? Well, I, I'd like to apologise. I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fraud. Um, I'm not a, a long-term <laughs> forester. My forestry knowledge doesn't go back uh, fifty or more years. But uh, I'm certainly aware of mixtures. Charles Darwin, in his great book, uh, Origin of Species, mentions yeah. the benefit of uh, mixtures in gra grass mixtures. Uh, yeah. So uh, mixtures have been known about for 150 years in, in terms of their increased growth rates. And it's been demonstrated in many places. What's different is that the last 10 years, uh, the scientific community has, has grasped uh, the, the full detail of this. And um, a publication about six years ago, uh, by Liang out of the States showed that um, in 750,000 uh, natural woodlands, forests across the world, there was an enhanced growth rate of uh, two to three fold 
in increasing uh, mixtures. And that has, has galvanized the scientific, the scientific forestry um, community into realizing mixtures are, are certainly beneficial for greater growth rates and carbon sequestration. So the science community is caught up uh, with people's single observations or uh, potential observations. And that's what, um, is what is what's driving the change to mixtures now. Yes, yes. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for that, Esmond. Um, I'm going to read out, we've got a, another anonymous um, or another question here from an anonymous attendee. So I'm going to read that out for you, Joe. Um, it's for the observed increase in growth for the oaks receiving higher CO2. Is the timber quality preserved or are the wider growth rings associated with lower wood density or quality? Thank you. And who is, who is that from? Sorry, it's an anonymous attendee. Right, thank you. So, so well, I'm thank you. Sure. That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I love this question. Uh, because um, foresters normally believe that the slower the growth rate of a tree, then the, then the stronger it is. Well, it depends on the structure of the timber. And uh, the conifers are different. Uh, they uh, and, and from deciduous trees. And deciduous trees can be divided into two groups, those which are ring porous, and those which are um, diffuse porous. And the, a ring porous tree, like an oak, uh, has two growth phases. There's the early spring growth, uh, when the leaves are flushing and the, all the roots are taking in fluid. And the xylem tubes are huge in that early first couple of weeks. And the, and the bigger the holes in, the, in timber, the bigger the xylem tubes, then the weaker the timber. But the rest of the year's growth in oak uh, has smaller xylem tubes, so the timber is stronger. And uh, since it's uh, the increased growth of a, a tree uh, is based on the summer growth, then the, with, the, with the smaller holes, then a fast growing oak with a bit faster, with a larger summer growth is always stronger. And this was known, it's been known a couple, for a couple of hundred years. Nelson, bless him, uh, had uh, uh, his ships built with fast growing oak because they absorbed the, power of the cannonballs much better than slow growing oak trees. So it's been known for a long time by Navy archi naval architects. Uh, the, um, the other type of uh, 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 porous trees, um, such as alder, have the holes the same in the spring and the summer growth. So their, their growth, however fast it is, doesn't alter the strength of the timber. And conifer trees, they have, um, their, their they have far more uh, um, xylem tubes in the summer growth uh, and uh, far more and they're smaller so because there are more tubes the uh, fast growing conifer trees are weaker so I showed you I showed you a picture early on of our fast growing oak uh, larch trees the hybrid larch uh, they're probably weaker um, the density of the of the larch is the same in the fast and slow growing larch so our sequestration uh, is is in proportion to the increased growth, which is about threefold greater, but they're probably weaker. Now we use our, our larch for cladding; it goes through the mill for cladding, which doesn't require strength. Larch isn't normally used for for strength timbers, but Douglas fir presumably would be a bit weaker, and it would have a lower grading uh, for use in in housing. But we don't know that yet. We'd have we'll have to wait and see. Mm. Okay. Well. Thank you. Uh, it, was a, it was a really good question. I'm glad that came up as well. And um, We've actually got um, a problem in terms of, I think we might have too many questions to get through in the time we have available, but we'll we'll do do our best to get through as many as we can. So if we do can... Do you want me to talk um, uh, less? <laughs> no, no, please don't. No, no. It's lovely. I think, no, I think we, we should do keep, 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 keep with the plan and have um, full answers to the questions we have. <laughs> so can we go to John Pitcairn, please? Uh, Good evening, John. Uh, Hello, Joe. How are we? Yeah, great. Nice name, Pitcairn. <laughs> um, I believe that the Forestry Commission were managing your larch plantations before you took over. Um, I want to know if you know how they were thinned or if they were thinned. Because if they were not thinned, then they would suppress each other and the difference between their growth rates and your growth rates could be accounted for by 
the lack of management in the past, as opposed to be attributable just to your halo polarding or your mixtures. Yes, well, the the uh, land was owned by uh, Lord Litchfield for two hundred and fifty years. The, um, the the Forestry Commission may have had some influence on what was done, but but I doubt it. Uh, but your, your your comments are absolutely right. Um, if if uh, trees are thinned appropriately, and and all the growth charts for Forest Commission uh, yield class tables have a, a fixed plan of thinning, uh, and that's to to give a maximum uh, yield of uh, of timber. Uh, but if you thin carefully on selected winners, those winners will grow better. And if you halo pollarded around them, there's no point if it's um, if it's a monoculture. There's no benefit in halo pollarding. You may as well just thin it. The, the benefit of the of the mixtures comes from maintaining the mixtures and the increased growth rates. And the, and the, the mixtures work partly because there's less pests and diseases. Uh, the soil. Uh, that you, if you plant an oak tree next to an oak tree, it competes directly with it. If you have a different species next to it, there's less competition. The root structure is different. The canopy is different. So uh, they grow better with less competition from identical neighbours. Uh, thank you. Lovely. We're, we're going to stick to a, a, a similar theme of maintenance and move to Ben Duncan, please. Ben, if you're there. Oh, good evening, Joe. Good evening, Ben. Um, thank you very much for the, this this uh, webinar. It's very enjoyable and very interesting. Um, I, thank you. I suppose I've got a question really about the commercial application um, for these newly planted woods where you've, you've got such a spread of, of species. Um, yes, I can understand that they're going to grow better and the, the maybe... Um, less i suppose less congestion for want of a better word but i i'm wondering how uh easy it is to then thin whatever might need thinning and how easy is it to uh, therefore get a contractor into to do a thinning operation and and how attractive might that be so i'm thinking really of the sort of smaller woodland owner and how he can manage his his woods really and and those issues Yes, well, uh, that's that's uh, that's an important issue, and we get asked that we haven't gone through a full cycle of uh, of tree growth and uh, and replacement yet. Uh, but in the initial woodlands, uh, we planted um, about thirty species, and uh, and the larch trees are whizzing. Uh, they'll be ready for harvesting at twenty years or so, when normally it would be fifty years. And so we we've, we've got a crop, uh, and uh, we we could regard all the other species as nurse trees. Uh, and they would be removed. There's oak and everything else in there. Uh, so we'd have a, a crop of, of larch at 20 years. Uh, we could replant with, a, with the same mixture and have another crop perhaps in another 20 years. So, uh, however, we've, uh, we didn't plant an intense amount of, of larch. So we, we, we always thought the, the main crop would be oak. Uh, when we, when we, um, when we uh, pollard, we have about 200 species. 200 winning trees per hectare so in a, in a in an oak plantation that's uh, we might have 60 or 70 per hectare so there's plenty of oak winners uh, we imagine it's growing that they're growing at about a centimeter a year so if we can drop the larch trees away from the oak uh, then we'll have a crop of oak trees at 60 centimeters perhaps in 60 years ready to crop out so that's how that's how we'll manage it However, we planted the first um, woodland, this complex mixture, uh, because I couldn't make up my mind what to, to plant. I didn't know anything about trees 14 years ago. And uh, the, the, uh, our advisor, our consultants, Prior and Rickett said, what would you want to, what do you want to plant? And I said, I have no idea, plant everything and, uh, and we'll decide later. Now, and now we're now later and we've planted other mixtures. So for instance, we've planted um, a mixture of uh, Douglas fir and Western red cedar as the final crop. They're 50% of the mixture and all the rest, all the other 25, 30 species in there are all nurse trees, but our final crop will be uh, those two conifers. Uh, yeah. So we can select one or the other and we'll do a, we would do a clear felling at maybe 25 years uh, for the Western red cedar or the Douglas fir. 
So, uh, so our thinking is different. That's more that's more conifer targeted. More uh, uh, what the uh, the uh, Forestry Commission uh, would like as a commercial forest. More that Till Hill would like uh, to crop out. So there are a variety of possibilities which we're still exploring. Thank you, thank you. But they can get at them. Well, they're, they're just a woodland uh, in the Amazon. There's 300 species per hectare. Uh, they managed to log the uh, the Amazon easily enough. Uh, well, yes, in, in, a, in a frightening way, yes. Yeah, well, they, we could frighteningly log uh, our 30 species and damage what's left there. But dropping the larch, we could we'd certainly keep, uh, we could avoid all the, uh, the oak winners. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Ben. We've got, we've got another question on squirrels, but a different a different angle. So can I invite Ross? Hello, evening, Ross. Uh, Ross Murray to... Uh... Ross Murray. Yes, right. Hi, Ross. Nice Hello, to... Joe. How are you? Yeah, great. Yes, thank Joe, you. Joe, How are you? Could you share your thoughts on um, gene editing and contraception? Yes, yes. Um, the uh, There are... Their techniques that have been talked about for some years. Uh, if we do the gene editing first, um, that's uh, a technique of uh, reducing fertility in squirrels or, or any animal. Uh, it's been known the technique has been discussed for 30 years or so and recently come up for trying to control squirrels. Um, it's in the future. Uh, gene editing in mammals has never been done. It's been applied to uh, insects. Uh, uh, so uh, whether it'll ever be acceptable to the public, I don't know, but it's it's 10 years away, uh, and at least, uh, from, from going through all its trials and releasing gene-edited squirrels into the environment. I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful about it. But anyway, that's uh, it's not from my decision, it's a public decision. Uh, the, um, the contraception uh, techniques have been, they've been talked about for five or six years or more with, with funding. A group uh, in Yorkshire have had good funding. Um, it's, a, it's an oral contraceptive based on uh, fertility hormone, uh, GnRH, which, um, which um, sterilizes males and female squirrels. Um, it has yet to be applied. It's yet to be fully, fully trialed in, in the, in the, in the environment, in well, not in the environment, even in, in a captive squirrel population. And even if it is good, it's going to take uh, several years to, uh, to go through all those trials and then apply. Uh, the squirrels will, uh, it only, only, it's only a contraceptive, so squirrels live five years or so. So if we add that to the trial period, that's 10 years away. Uh, but I wish them the best of luck. Uh, we need to get rid of squirrels. But squirrel trapping will be around for us, with us for 10 years or more. So any woodlands we plant needs squirrel, squirrel control for at least 10 years. And all their modelling does include uh, squirrel trapping as well as uh, contraceptives. And uh, uh, to be quite blunt with you, a good whack on the neck of a squirrel is a great contraceptive. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Ross. Ross. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, we've got, um, there was another question on squirrels on the same, same theme, actually. So you answered that one already with, uh, with your response just now. Um, there's another anonymous attendee question here about uh, carbon capture. It says uh, if you plant on ex agricultural land, the sequestration in your new wood is countered by the carbon loss on replacement farmland. If food demand stays constant, what do you say? Yes, yes. Well, well, uh, farmland, uh, if we're talking about carbon sequestration, farmland doesn't accumulate carbon. Uh, the carbon is removed from the land, uh, agricultural land, in, in the cropping. So if we take wheat or barley off land, then it always depletes the carbon, uh, which is a major problem for carbon, for, for arable soils. Uh, a, good, a good soil has about 8% carbon. Uh, the arable lands across the UK have uh, 2 to 3% uh, carbon. When it gets below 2%, the soils become almost sterile and the crops grow very poorly and you get dust bowls as we saw in the States uh, in the 30s. Uh, we've changed our arable land. We've, we, we've uh, gone to um, complex mixtures of herbs uh, with, again, the complex mixtures, 23 in our, in our herbal lays. And we drill the, drill the herbs in. Uh, they're used for uh, pasture land for neighboring farms, neighboring dairy farm uh, young, uh, young cattle. Uh, they're 
the carbon builds up in them, uh, replacing uh, 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 replacing the lost carbon, and they're very fertile from a from a from a, a cattle point of view. The cattle now go on those lands over the summer, and they can send the cattle direct to market because they've fattened up so much better on these on these herbal lays. So the farm, the, our neighbouring farms are all adopting uh, these these herbal lays. Uh, in the in the in the soils in the in the woodland, the the carbon build up has been to about eight percent, and we add that into our carbon calculation. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Uh, we we're we're um, running close to time, so I'm going to ask uh, another question that's that's come in from an anonymous attendee, um, and then um, I'll move to to Chris and to Joe. So so this question, Joe. I visited the FACE facility and was impressed by the scientific approach to understanding the change in growth rates due to elevated CO2. Are the plans to apply similar levels of science to the effect of mixtures in your planted woodlands and determine optimum mixtures for highest growth rates? Well, thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Um, the 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 uh, university run, the Birmingham University run the face facility. There are a hundred people involved with it. There are a dozen professors. Uh, um, it's a very complex uh, uh, scientific environment and uh, and very successful. Um, and they have uh, they have about um, ten hectares of of our woodland. And of course, I've given up that ten acres for the face facility for, for fifteen years or so. I don't want to give up um, the rest of our woodlands to the university. Uh, we get lots of students marauding over it, and and <laughs> and, and postdoctoral uh, 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 scientists and professors. And uh, I want to keep my, the woodlands, uh, my woodlands. I'm I'm uh, I want to keep the beauty of them without them being uh, uh, rampaged over by a hundred scientists. And and that. But to come back to the question, would are would there be better optimal mixtures? Well, the, the most likely are. Uh, the, the scientific community across the world is doing mixtures. Uh, there are lots of experiments on, the, on, on it. Uh, I think we were one of the first to evaluate complex mixtures in the way we have, but there are lots of experiments going on and they will, dis they will determine across the world what the optimal mixtures are. Uh, but my view is the more the better. Every extra species you add adds a bit more carbon sequestration. It's a law of diminishing returns. If you've got 30 species and you add one more, it might only add an extra 1% carbon into that mixture. But we all know that every extra species uh, has a diff slightly different niche in the woodland, slightly different uh, sunlight requirement, so it adds a bit more carbon. So I'll leave that to others. I'm, I'm, I'm too old to, to watch another woodland grow for uh, 20 years. Okay, well, well, thank you. So uh, the last, the last <coughs> question is, I'm, I'm going to give myself the privilege of asking this one. And I'm make it a, a seasonal a seasonal one we have, we're not far from christmas and i know i know you um have got uh, plans uh in train for a, a truffle truffle farm in your woodland do you want to tell us a little bit about about your truffles joe well i'll i'll tell you a little about it i'm not going to tell you where they are <laughs> um, <laughs> we we have the dog walkers and uh, others and uh, that might uh, find them, and the dogs, would, of course, would uh, would 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 uh, dig them up. Uh, uh, woodlands don't make any money overall. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a real.